In this video, we're going to learn about scales of measurement. Now, we won't be doing any computations here, but understanding scales of measurement is going to be really important moving forward because you're going to see it come up in a lot of different places. But before I get too ahead of myself, I want to give you a quick definition of what we're talking about here. Scales of measurement simply describe the nature of our data. They're ways of just characterizing what we're talking about, what's in our spreadsheet, for example. What kind of data are we looking at? And I think the best way to learn scales of measurement are to go through them individually. And so here are four scales of measurement. We have nominally scaled data, ordinal scale data, interval scale data, and ratio scale data. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through each of these in turn. You're going to notice some similarities and some differences. I'm really going to try and highlight that, especially the differences between them to help you differentiate between them. You'll also see that each scale of measurement sort of builds on the one that came before it. And I want to note that and encourage you to really look for that as we go through these because it's going to be really key to understanding scales of measurement. So let's go ahead and start with nominal scales of measurement. The key thing to know about nominal scales of measurement is that the data is non-numerical. It can only be qualitative. If you have numbers in your data set, you can automatically rule out nominal as the scale of measurement. So each item in your data set needs to belong to a class or a category. And here are some examples. You can kind of see a hint at the first one here, gender. Something that psychologists might commonly ask in the context of a study. We'll often include demographics questionnaires where we ask things like gender, political orientation, and race. So we can look, for example, at political orientation. You can be Republican or Democrat, Libertarian, Independent, Modern Whig, whatever floats your boat. So in each of these cases, we're looking at non-numerical data. Republican is not a number. And each item in the set belongs to a category. You're either Republican or you're Democrat. And there's not really any overlap there. So this is nominally scaled data. And we've seen an example of a nominal scale uh, variable here when we were learning to calculate the mode in our measures of central tendency video. So here we're looking at different beverage orders, espressos, latte, chai tea, and so on. So these variables here are non-numerical. They belong to different categories. And so they're a great example of nominal scale data. So let's talk about ordinal scale data. Again, it's going to kind of build on nominal scale data. In this case, we have one new little feature here. The data can be quantitative or qualitative. And so you might have numbers in your data set, or you might have words in your data set. So you can't just look at it and know automatically. You have to dig a little bit deeper. But here's the key thing behind ordinal scale uh, data. The ORD stands for order. And so there's a key order to the data. The items in your data set need to be ordered in a meaningful direction. And here's where I have to mention this last bit as a way of differentiating what's going to come next. But it's going to sound a little abstract and random for now, but we'll go through examples. And hopefully by the end of the video, these little abstract details will make more sense. So for ordinally scaled data, the distance between items is not necessarily equal. So this is another way of saying that there isn't an equal interval between different points in your data set. So we'll talk about that through examples. So what are some examples of ordinally scaled data? One is race results. You might have somebody in a 5K, for example, they get first place, somebody else gets second place, somebody else gets third place. So I can either make this quantitative, maybe in my spreadsheet, for example, I'll write down one, two, and three, or I can make it qualitative and I can actually uh, write down first place, second place, and third place. Another example that you might see, especially in psychology, but in lots of different disciplines that use surveys to collect data, you might see responses like this in your data set. Strongly agree, agree, disagree, and strongly disagree. So in this case, we're looking at an order to these data. It's qualitative in this case, but there's a meaningful order here. And so this is ordinal. Uh, I want to take a second to highlight this key point right here. The distance between items is not necessarily equal. So let's say, you know, I'm a professor. Let's say I wanted to rank my students in my class so that I can give some public sort of praise to the top three performers, just an ex as an example. I, of course, wouldn't really do this, but I very well could. So here's my top performer, 
my second best student and my third best student. And so let's take this point here, distance between items not necessarily being equal. Let's illustrate that by looking at how these students are actually performing in the class. So my first ranked student is getting a 99% in the class, very good. My second ranked student is getting a 91% in the class, and my third ranked student is getting a 90% in my class. So hopefully you can see here that the distance between these different students and how they're doing is not necessarily equal. They're ordered, but not necessarily equal. Between rank one and rank two is an 8% difference, but between rank two and rank three is only a 1% difference. And this is where the interval scale of measurement is gonna come into play. So for intervally scaled data, you're looking at numerical data only, only quantitative data. Has to be numbers. If you see words, you can rule out interval. You can also rule out ratio for that matter, as we'll talk about. So here, the distance between points is now equal, unlike for ordinal, and it's meaningful. We'll go through examples of that and this. I think this is the weirdest bit of the whole thing, but I have to mention it. The relationship between those points, although they're equal and meaningful, uh, the relationship between the points is not meaningful. So I'll, I'll do an example to make that clear. And as one last note, you can have values below zero. So let's go through examples. I think interval is the weirdest to kind of fully understand, and so examples are really important. I'll give you two. One is time of day, for example, 1 p.m., 2 p.m., 3 p.m., 4 a.m., all of that. Another example is temperature in degrees Fahrenheit and also in degrees Celsius. Uh, so let's take one of these. Let's take temperature, degrees Fahrenheit, and kind of uh, evaluate it uh, along these dimensions. So first of all, it's numerical, right? I can put one degree Fahrenheit, two, three, six, whatever, in my data set, so it's numerical. The distance between points is equal. The difference between five and six degrees is the same as the difference between six and seven degrees, and that's meaningful. It's a one degree difference, a one degree difference in heat, and I can quantify that, and that means something consistently. But the relationship between points is not meaningful, and again, this is the weirdest to understand, but I like to do a little test to kind of determine this. Here's the test. Can you say something like two o'clock times two is four o'clock? You can't, right? It doesn't really make sense. You can't say that, you know, 8 p.m. is twice as much as 4 p.m. And similarly, when you're talking about degrees Fahrenheit, it just isn't true that 10 degrees Fahrenheit is twice as hot as 5 degrees Fahrenheit. That's not how it works. There's not twice as much heat in 10 degrees Fahrenheit as in 5 degrees Fahrenheit. So in this case, we're talking about intervally scaled data. Now, I will mention depending on how you measure these things, it makes a difference because you can measure temperature in Kelvin. If you've ever learned about degrees Kelvin, it has this really interesting feature of uh, you know, having this true zero point. And we're gonna talk about that when it comes to ratio. And that will kind of permit you to say things like five degrees Kelvin is twice as much as two and a half degrees Kelvin. And that's true and it makes sense. And that's where ratio comes into play, like I said. So let's talk about that. Ratio is going to be numerical, only numbers, no words. Now, again, everything builds on what came before it. It has all of the properties of the interval scale of measurement, plus that true zero point I was just hinting at with degrees Kelvin. And what this true zero point means is that the absence of whatever is being measured has to be possible. So you can think, for example, about zero degrees Fahrenheit. That's not the coldest possible. That doesn't mean a complete absence of heat. Zero doesn't really mean zero there, and so it's not ratio. Degrees Kelvin, in contrast, has that absolute zero point. Zero means zero. There's nothing colder than it. There's no uh, you know, lower quality, uh, excuse me, quantity than that. And so that's what makes degrees Kelvin actually ratio. So both are ways of measuring temperature, but depending on how you measure that idea of temperature, it makes a difference on what scale of measurement you're talking about. And because of this quality of having this true zero point, the relationship between points is meaningful. The ratios between different points are meaningful. So let's go over a couple examples. One is inches, right? If you are zero inches tall, there's a complete absence of you, right? There is no you, so it makes sense. It's kind of weird to think about, but you know, theoretically it makes sense here. And I can also say things like, eight inches is twice as much as four inches. So the relationship between points 
is meaningful. It passes that little test. We can also talk about percentage correct on an exam, right? The student who scored a 100% on the exam did twice as much as the student who scored, uh, you know, a 50% a, a or whatever. Uh, you can also get a 0%. I hope not, but it's definitely possible to earn no points, a complete absence of points on the exam. And also the amount of money in your wallet. If you have $0 in your wallet, there's a complete absence of money in your wallet. And the person who has $10 has twice as much as the person who has $5. And I just want to quickly note a little bit about why this matters. Uh, scales of measurement are going to determine a lot of things that you can and cannot do with your data. So for example, if we look at measures of central tendency, the mean, median, and mode that we talked about before, uh, you'll see here that a lot of these are fine. You can do the mode on anything. You can do the median on interval ratio and ordinal data and so on. But some of these are X'd out because they just can't be done on these certain scales of measurement. Think about this example. Uh, if we're looking at the median, we cannot compute a median for nominal data. And this is because the first step in calculating the median is ordering all the values in your data set. But nominal data has no order to it, and so we can't find the median. Similarly, we can't do the mean of, say, ordinal data or nominal for the same reason. How would you compute the mean of strongly agree, strongly disagree, and so on, or of men and women? The mean there just doesn't make sense. So again, as you'll see, scales of measurement are going to determine what we can and can't do. In the next video, for example, we'll look at graphs, we'll look at visualizing data, and we'll see that depending on your scale of measurement, some graphs are going to be appropriate, others just can't be done. And so keep scales of measurement in mind as we progress.